In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You are what you eat. It's a proverbial saying which dietitians have been using to sell books for decades now. In the ancient world, one might say that there was a different understanding. You are what you worship. This is not only found in Greek philosophy, but also in the gods of Greece and the Near East. Baal and Zeus were gods of thunder and storm. Moloch and Hephaestus, gods of fire. Katesh and Aphrodite were goddesses of lust, desire and love. Power, fertility, success. These are the gods who surrounded Israel. These are what were promised to the devotee through worshipping these entities. So what does it mean to worship our God? God is certainly powerful. He is the creator, but he does not promise power to those who worship him. Our Lord often declares himself to be the father of the fatherless and the God who defendeth the cause of the widows. He is the God of orphans and widows, the weak and helpless the God who will come to the earth to right wrongs and establish justice. I don't know of another God of the orphans or God of the poor, except for our God. Our Lord often declares himself to be the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel. But this was differently understood to the other people's national gods. Israel, when they were being well behaved, attributed their successes to God, like the other nations did. But their nation was always weak and unimportant, conquered and enslaved by most of its neighbors. They built no mighty cities, wielded no great armies, built no awesome wonders. The almighty creator did not make an empire out of his people, but a minor and insignificant kingdom, which did not last very long before it was broken up. The ultimate revelation of God comes through the cross, where God's perfect wisdom is revealed as worldly folly and his almighty strength revealed as weakness and defeat. Why worship a God who lost is a question which was often thrown at the disciples. Throughout the scriptures, God is unhuman in the way he uses what he has. He does not exploit any opportunity to his own advantage. He doesn't host a dinner to climb the social ladder and get to know the right people. He always gives without expecting a return. He pours himself out in service to others. The Pharisees in the gospel today had forgotten who their God was. They had forgotten that through their weak nation, all the filthy, sinful, Gentile idolaters would be blessed. Now, with the Lord in their midst, they were were to be reminded of who their God was, what his promises are, and what grace they had received. So Jesus is eating a Sabbath meal with the Pharisees. It's important to note that this story would have first been told by Luke as the Christians were eating their Sabbath meal, the Eucharist. And we again are hearing this story at our Eucharist. The story is partly concerned with what we are doing when celebrating the mass. It's set in this context. This wasn't a relaxing dinner party, however. Jesus had started out by healing someone and given that it was the Sabbath, a debate ensued as to what was proper to do. He thwarted his hosts, and then Jesus began a series of parables concerned with meals. He begins by praising those who humble themselves by taking the lower seats rather than seeking to promote themselves. He tells of the blessings of giving without expectation of a return, of inviting the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind to feasts, rather than one's friends and relations, people from whom they could expect another invitation in return, opportunities from which they could gain. He has accused the Pharisees of being completely self-absorbed, completely prideful. They seek earthly comforts and pleasures rather than to love and serve their neighbours and share in the eternal heavenly blessings. Their calling to be the holy people, God's light in the world, has made them conceited and unfaithful to their calling. Jesus tells a third parable that confronts the Pharisees head on and has two aspects that we should note. One touches on God's plan of salvation set down from before the beginning of time. It is concerned with the Old Testament promises to call the Gentiles to worship the Lord. The other is to do with what it means to be faithful to that call for Jew and Gentile alike. 
a man invites all the people he would expect to show up for a supper and they offer excuses. The excuses given are disingenuous and frankly rubbish, though commonplace enough that the guests around the table with Jesus on this occasion might have thought them reasonable. When the servant returned with the dismal news, the master was angry. Having such a bountiful table adorned and spread, he refused to have the meal go to waste. The servant was sent first to the suburbs of the city, then, and for long afterwards, suburbs were the least desirable places to live, to ask those from the streets and lanes, the homeless and destitute, the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, to come. Yet there was still room, so the servant was sent out a second time to the highways and hedges to compel even wayfarers to come in until the house was filled. There may be an allusion to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, where wisdom calls aloud in the streets, or, as St. Ambrose puts it, sings aloud in the alleyways. Certainly, it was folly to refuse, for the master then, as it were, barred the door. None of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. By this point, those present could probably sense that Jesus was suggesting that even some of, among the despised Gentiles were included in the master's feast. This thought would have been received by the Pharisees, all scriptures about strangers and sojourners notwithstanding, as formal insult. The point that is essential to grasp here is that, unlike many of us, God is no respecter of persons, and that while man looks at the outward appearances, the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus' parable is a universal call to an examination of conscience. As it is written, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. It exempts nobody. Hospitality and humility are complementary virtues. Both are requisite for obedience to the commandment that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Many of the church fathers saw in this parable the bringing in of the Gentiles into the church, the renewed Israel, God's people. Does this mean that we, as Gentile members of Christ's body, can come to enter this parable comfortable in the knowledge that God did call the Gentiles and all is now well? Of course not. Each of us has received Israel's calling to shine forth in the world, to offer the Lord holy sacrifices and worship, to proclaim God's signs and wonders, and preach that Christ is coming to fulfill all the promises of the scriptures. We are all susceptible to the Pharisees' complacency, perhaps even more so in the Church of England than our brothers and sisters who live under persecution and those who live in dire poverty. We are both the poor and the Pharisee. We are sinful members of an idolatrous Gentile nation who, through Christ's crucifixion, have peace with God to live unto righteousness. Christ has brought us in from the streets and lanes and hedges to feast at the master's table, as we do at each mass. The prayer of humble access reminds us of how we approach this banquet, mindful of our poverty as we approach the holy sacrament. This is something to celebrate and rejoice about. At the same time, however, I am guilty of the Pharisee's sin. I have been a temple of the Holy Spirit, a baptized member of the church since I was six weeks old. I've been brought up my whole life in the knowledge and love of God, knowing freedom from sin and death, and that my life is hidden with Christ beyond, safe and secure. Yet I might easily succumb to the blindness of the Pharisees, complacent of the gifts and blessings that I have never known what it is to exist without. Very easily I might forget who I am, who my God is, what the gospel is. Our first lesson we heard reminds us of what it means to be faithful, to our calling by God, our calling of love. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Consider what are your excuses, which may appear reasonable, but are feeble when compared with God's plans. What is preventing you from bringing the poor and lost to the Lord's feast? There is currently a lot of discussion as to how the church has been complicit in racism. 
cursing rather than blessing our neighbor and even brother or sister in Christ. One might say that especially in this day and age, it is easy to lose God's perspective. In a world so caught up with the material, so caught up in the present and immediate, that all of us to some extent struggle to live our minds set on the eternal. We all strive for authority and success which pass away. And we do not focus on thanksgiving for the inheritance of all creation and the treasures of heaven which we have freely received. Let us therefore come to the Lord in prayer and sacrament to seek his strength and light, that we may be faithful to him and his promises all of our earthly days. Father, fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we may walk worthy of you, fully pleasing to you, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in knowledge of you. May we be strengthened with all might according to your glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. We give thanks to you who have qualified us to be sharers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You have delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of your love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Guide us, Lord, to seek the lost in this world, that by your grace we may bring them to feast at your altar and behold your glory and honour and power. To you be the glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen.